good light in beautiful places is what draws us out as landscape photographers into the landscape. But as many of us know, simply taking photos of good light in beautiful places doesn't always equate to a good photograph. And the reason for this is because a good photograph is comprised of two halves. We do need good light, but we also need good composition. So image composition, as easy as I can explain it, is arranging elements of the scene into a photograph. And so it's simply putting a frame around what we see. Um, nature is generally very chaotic and haphazard, and when the photographer arranges these, these elements in a visually pleasing way into a photograph, that is the act of image composition. But the job of a photographer goes far beyond just visually uh, creating visually pleasing photos. Uh, our job mainly is to tell the story of that place, is to allow the viewer to connect emotionally and to maybe experience a little bit of what we've experienced standing there in front of that scene or in front of that object. Now saying all that is much easier than understanding what makes some compositions uh, tell a better story than others. And sure there are rules that we can follow, rule of third, things like that, that you know are good places to start, may be very helpful for some, but if we were to actually believe what Edward Weston said, um, that following the rules of composition when creating a photograph is the same as you know consulting the rules of gravity before we take a walk, um, which you know I, I firmly agree, and I, I believe that if we are consulting the rules of, of composition when we're out taking photographs, then we're not allowing ourselves to be truly creative. So are we just supposed to aim our camera at at anything and just you know click the shutter at random? No. Uh, the reason for this photo is to explain just some of my my thought process and my workflow as I go into the field and take images. So hopefully you can see kind of my thought process around composition and why I can post photos the way I do. First, I think the most important question that we need to ask ourselves, and the one thing if you want to take anything away from this video is to remember this, to ask yourself in the field, why do I want to take a picture of this? What about this scene speaks to me? And so the answer to that question is really telling. It's going to tell you a little bit about yourself. It's going to tell you what you're drawn to, what you're fascinated with in that scene. And so that answer to that question will be the subject of your photo, or as I like to call it, the primary point of interest. Now, for simplicity's sake, I'm going to be referring to this as the subject, just because it is what other people um, kind of are, are used to. But no, when I'm talking about the subject, I'm not talking about uh, necessarily a tangible thing, something that we can touch, something we can see. Um, it might be uh, an abstraction of the kind of human experience. So a photo like this, um, it's simply a photo of uh, light piercing darkness. So while there's no tangible subject there, the subject is, is more of an abstract type thing. And so what I found uh, in my own experience is the idea of having to have a tangible subject in my photo really limited my creativity. Um, it was one of those rules that I uh, referred to that really limited uh, my own freedom of expression in my photography, is having to have a subject in every photo. It's that I need to put my camera at something. And so that really limited you know, what I could actually see in the landscape. Whereas the way I look at it now, I look at it in terms of a primary point of interest. So what do I want my photo to tell? What story am I sharing with this with the viewer? It could be about a specific thing, uh, or it could be a more abstract kind of thing about a human, the human experience. And so uh, understanding why you want to take a photo and what story you want to tell with it, that's a really good place to start. And so from here, I can share uh, a few things that um, just to keep in mind uh, as we go through here. Number one is that um, competition in an image composition is bad. So if you have if you have two competing primary points of interest or two subjects that compete for the viewer's attention, it's very difficult for the viewer to really connect with that photo because they aren't sure what story you're trying to tell. And so focusing your attention on what 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 speaks to you the most in that scene, um, what you care about the most is going to uh, lend itself to a much, much better photograph. Is There's a focus, a focal point of that scene and a primary point of interest. And so finding one thing, whether it's an abstraction or or a tangible point of interest, having that one thing really kind of can help strengthen the photograph. And number two is using light. We talk about light a lot in landscape photography. And honestly, I could create a whole video series on light, the different kinds of it, and how it can shape image composition know that it plays a huge part and if you have light in your scene make sure that the light accentuates the composition that you are you are trying to to 
to communicate with the viewer that, that it's not fighting against what you're doing. Those things said, I do want to jump into just a few practical approaches, how I go about looking at composition in the field. So the first approach to composition for landscape photography that I want to discuss, um, my, one of my approaches in the field is to look for balance. Finding balance is not an easy thing to do by any stretch of the imagination. Nature, like I said, is generally chaotic and haphazard. So finding elements that complement each other or work together um, in a really visually kind of pleasing way is really difficult uh, to find. So I'm going to go through a couple of examples to show what I mean by balance. So first and the most obvious is the symmetrical balance. So essentially, this is the most uh, simple way of understanding what balance is. So you have a simple mountain reflection here. So in this case, the subject is the the mountain and the light on the mountain. So you have two halves to this image. You have the, the actual landscape and you have the reflection of the landscape. So the viewer is not wondering what this photo is about. It's fairly clear and obvious. Um, and these two elements don't compete with one another because they are the same thing. So balance, symmetrical balance is a, is a fairly simple way to communicate with the viewer uh, what you want that photograph to say. So a little more challenging is finding complementary elements in nature that work together to support your subject. So in this case, you have a, a, a balance between the sky and the ice. So there are similar shapes and textures and patterns to the ice and the clouds. So you have, you know, different lines um, that kind of swoop through here and then those kind of mimic down, you know, in the ice. So you have all these different shapes and, and they're very kind of, kind of whimsical and wispy. And so they all work together um, there is a, a balance between the sky and the ice, which really leaves the viewer looking at the mountain in the end, which is the subject of the photo. So in this case, it's not symmetrical balance, but there's enough similarity between the sky and the ice for the viewer to kind of give that aha moment where this is kind of, oh, that's kind of cool. It's almost the same kind of thing. So that aha moment really kind of helps the viewer to kind of stick with the photo and understand what it's about. And this is an example of asymmetrical balance. So where you don't have that symmetry or you don't have those complementary items. So in this scene, you can divide the photo strictly in half and you have two parts of this image. Um, you have the stars here and you have this bank of trees over here. If I were to crop this photo at this point, obviously it would work much the same. However, what makes this photograph as compelling as it is is this tree right here. The fact that it's by itself on its own half of the image. And so the viewer is left with enough tension in the image to, to kind of go back and look at it a little, a little bit more deeply to understand what it means, what it's about. Um, if it were just uh, this photo of, you know, the trees with the stars, it's easy to pass over. But because we have this tree here that's creating that, that asymmetry or that, uh, that kind of question in the viewer's mind, um, it really kind of adds tension to the photo, which is, it's a good thing to add a little bit of tension in the photo. So the viewer can spend a little more time on it to try and figure it out. So asymmetrical balance is a really kind of nice technique to use. It's very difficult to kind of actually implement, but once you, if you do succeed, it can create a really compelling image. So the second compositional approach I like to take in the field is looking for lines. The lines are fairly uh, straightforward. Um, basically they are, they can be either solid lines or kind of suggestive lines. So things that uh, basically point the viewer or lead the viewer directly towards what your subject is. Um, normally these can kind of originate from the bottom edges of the photo and lead you up into the photo, um, but they can also be, they can also originate from the sky and kind of point down towards. So a couple of examples, um, this being ones, so obviously you have these strong lines that are leading the viewer up into the photo. Even the snow is pointing you in towards the photo. You have lines kind of everywhere that are directing the viewer up into the photo. So, and another example, um, we have using snow drifts that are pointing the viewer in towards the frame. And so in this case though, I've managed to use the Milky Way as a line, and then all the clouds are pointing towards the subject as well here. Now, not all lines need to be solid. Um, suggestive lines kind of work as well. When you have items that are kind of fairly close together that do kind of connect. So in this case, you have 
these items are kind of pointing you towards the tree. So it's creating almost an arrow, right? Where you're pointing towards the tree. So in this case, this is suggestive line. You have these items that do kind of create their own arrow. And so that is uh, a use of suggestive lines. Now, one of the strongest uses of lines in, uh, in landscape photography is finding curves or kind of Z shapes, things that can lead the viewer through a larger percentage of the photo. When you have uh, lines that are straight, they generally kind of rush the viewer into the photo. When you have kind of those slow sweeping lines that move you through the photo, the viewer is kind of able to go on a visual journey through that photo. So in this case, I have these, these curves, right? These soft curves that kind of are moving you up and then kind of around here. The viewer is really able to kind of meander through this whole photo to really kind of move slowly through it to really kind of fixate on that, that lone cloud on the horizon. So there's a use of curves here. And in this example, I've used curves again um, to, to speak to a more abstract type thing. Um, so you can see this curving line really kind of draws the viewer throughout the entirety of the photo. And the interesting thing about this photo is the line actually leaves the photo, but the viewer is able to pick it back up here and move back through the photo into this big emptiness. So there's a mysteriousness of this photo. The viewer is really able to kind of put themselves into the photo, but imagine what it could look like beyond that. So I mean, I've done that by, obviously you can't include everything on this side, but I've cut off the bend on this side on purpose so the viewer can basically move through here and then with their imagination, finish the photo. And then they can imagine what could be behind in this bank of clouds. So this photo, Curves works well because I'm trying to make the viewers slow down and really kind of take in the whole scene so that they can imagine what could be beyond it. So curves are a really, really good use of lines in landscape photography composition. And if you can find lines, they are really, really um, kind of direct. They, they really kind of tell, uh, they really help you tell a really good story because they really support the subject really, really well. So a third compositional approach I like to use in the field is layers. So using overlapping layers can create a great sense of depth in your photo. It can allow the viewer to really kind of move into your photo um, slowly as they move through the different layers and levels into your photo to a visual payoff. So that payoff could be um, like, again, a specific uh, tangible point of interest. It could be the way that the light is interacting with one of those layers, or it could be uh, a more abstract type thing. Um, and so I wanna run through just a couple of examples of what I mean by that. In this example, you have a few different layers. You have obviously, you know, one, two, and then there's, four, you know, four or five different layers. So there's a sense of depth in this photo. You have the sense that these trees are fairly close and then as you get further back, these trees are obviously farther away. So the viewer can understand this is a three-dimensional scene. And the visual payoff in this case is the way that the light is interacting with this middle layer. So this is again, it's a, it's a spring scene. So there's a lot of spring greens and then there's a nice golden light that's hitting these, these, these leaves, making them almost look like a, like a fall scene. So, um, the way the light's interacting with this middle layer is the kind of subject of this photo. And so in this case, I'm using layers to communicate a more abstract idea. So it's like a lot of these examples I've shown you have a tangible point of interest, but using these, uh, these different approaches, you can really create a more, uh, an, an abstract image as well. So in this case, the layers, you have one layer, two layers, three, and then four. So there are different layers and levels of these, of these burnt trees. And so the idea of this photograph, it's called rejuvenated. So the idea behind this photograph is to allow the viewer to really see the rejuvenation of, of what happens in nature. So we have these burnt trees, but we have this the moist, dense cloud moving through it, kind of washing it free. And then so you have that rejuvenation process happening. And so that's what this photo is about. And so I use the layers as a means of, of expressing that. Another way to look at layers is basically how you've placed objects. And so um, using different uh, objects in different uh, settings so that you can, you can really kind of step the viewer into the photo. So in this case, you know, I have gripping of flowers, you know, all these guys. 
and then the viewer is able to kind of move level by level, you know, from this grouping, you know, to this, to this, and then further back, and then obviously to the visual payoff of the light on the mountain. So there's no layers per se, you have different levels though. The viewer is able to kind of move further into the, into the photo. So when I'm talking about layers, I could mean uh, visual steps, so the, visu the viewer can kind of step and move into the photo. Um, but basically what I'm talking about is creating visual depth in your photo. So the fourth approach I like to take in the field, you know, the number's a bit weird because this is the number five tip and this is the fourth approach in the field, but that first tip, having a subject, uh, and kind of as number one, so. Um, anyways, uh, isolation. Uh, so isolating your subject is a really powerful way to express um, to the viewer what your photo is about, what the story you're telling. So this approach utilizes negative space around the photo, around the around the subject, in order to really communicate to the viewer what that photo is about. So um, really leading the viewer towards the highest point of contrast in your photo, or whether the colors are very different in, um, around one kind of subject. So this is really challenging. Um, nature, like I said, is very generally chaotic and haphazard. So finding um, uh, a subject that can be isolated is very difficult. It's easier to do with color more so than uh, contrast. So a couple of examples. So this one, um, pretty straightforward. The viewer is drawn to the only contrast in the scene. Um, if you look at the black and white photo, um, really heavy fog, um, really kind of eliminated everything in the background and left me with just this old tree. So this this tree is clearly the subject of the photo and there's nothing else really for the viewer to really see. So there's a good use of negative space all the way around the tree that really kind of just accentuates this tree as being the subject. So this is isolation. Now this photo, it's it's isolation, but there's a little bit more, uh, there's a lot more complexity in it. So there's a lot more depth with these snow pillows in the background but this is the subject of the photo and it's isolated against that white background. So there's, there's a use of isolation, there's also use of layers here. So you can use more than one approach, but in this case, this is an example of isolation where you have that, uh, again, that, that contrast of the subject against a fairly blank negative canvas around it. Now, it's not all about just blank canvas around it. This is a very chaotic, busy scene as in, in a lot of nature. But I've used depth of field here to really help my uh, help the viewer to really focus on the subject. There's also a difference of color. So you have the blues in the background, but this is the only kind of stark white tree. So there's no competition for the viewer in terms of color. So the viewer is always attracted to what's brightest in the scene. So in this case, it's this white tree. So there's really nothing for the viewer that's competing for attention. So the attention for this is really going right towards the tree and everything else is uh, kind of in the background. It's not really drawn any focus. So in this case, I've isolated this tree against its uh, kind of the background um, by using uh, light and then the different colors in the scene. So, so the fifth and final approach that I'm gonna share with you that I like to kind of take in the field is framing. So framing is basically a frame within a frame. So you've already basically put a square or frame around the scene in front of you. But framing is using different elements in the scene to frame your subject. So an example is this. So we have the subject is this tree that is receiving light. And so if this was just the tree and there was nothing else around it, it would work in the sense of isolation. And here though, I've used the darker trees that are very straight, very vertical, to block the viewer from even looking over here. So the viewer's attention is drawn here because there is too many, uh, dis uh, not distractions, but too many obstacles in the frame on the outside edge that really kind of force the viewer to move into the center of the frame. And so here's an example where I've used this similar type of thing. Um, these aspen trees are framing this lone conifer and there's this opening in here um, that the viewer is able to kind of really look at. So these trees here, and then all this, and then these two are really framing this opening right here. So it's it's allowing the viewer to kind of move in towards what I want the viewer to see, which is mainly this conifer and the scene that's happening in behind all this. So the viewer is able to move inwards, in towards this portion of the photo, and then from there is able to move back through behind these aspen trees. And this is another example where I use framing. And so the Milky Way, um, the arch in May and June 
is a really nice way to frame a subject. So in this case, this tree here is the subject and the Milky Way is doing a good job of containing the viewer's eye into that scene. So rarely is anybody coming up here or um, kind of coming down here because there is just so much focus is being drawn to this tree. So, and that's largely because of the framing that's happening with the Milky Way. So that's the last one. Framing in landscape photography can really enhance that composition. So it starts with the subject. Knowing why you want to take that photograph, answering that question why is really, really a good place to start. And from there, there are different tools you can use to really kind of tell the story of that place. So I hope you found this video helpful. If you have any questions, please feel free to send me a comment or drop me a line on my website, and I'd be happy to answer them for you and really help you out. Um, that way, if you want, there's a free e-course on my website about uh, image composition in landscape photography, runs through a few of these things that we've talked about here and goes more, a little bit more in depth. And hopefully um, you find that useful. It's a uh, five week, six part series on image composition in landscape photography. Again, it's free and you can start anytime. So if that would be helpful to you, please feel free to sign up on my website. I'll put the link below in the description and thanks so much for watching. And we'll catch you on the next one. Bye for now.